Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is James W. Gesso. James is a Canadian-born author, public speaker, educator, storyteller, podcast host and psychonaut. Your work is inspired by your healing path through depression, substance abuse and trauma and focuses on translating the profound insights of the psychedelic experience into a higher quality of life for both the individual and society. Since 2011, you've delivered more than 100 public speaking events spanning across 11 different countries. Your two books, Decomposing the Shadow and The True Light of Darkness, present a model for working with the magic psilocybin mushroom as an ally in personal transformation and developing psycho-spiritual maturity. Your articles, essays, interviews and lectures go far beyond just the psychedelic experience, covering topics such as psychology, relationships, spirituality, consciousness, sexuality, nutrition, and brain health. Your Adventures Through the Mind podcast and YouTube channel is an effort to contribute to the psychedelic culture at large, featuring interviews with luminaries in science, art and culture across a range of disciplines. This platform expands your work into a more broad exploration of progressive social developments and the potential role psychedelics might play within them. James, it's tremendous to have you here. Welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant to have you here. Um, as I was saying to you uh, before we started rolling the cameras, I've followed your work for, for a long time, so it's a, it's a real pleasure. Yeah, it's nice to be here. This is a beautiful space. I love being in Edinburgh. This is my second time, and uh, each time seems to be getting better and better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Glad to hear that. <laughs> so, I mean, if we can start by going back to your uh, early life, where you grew up, and I suppose just generally what that experience was like for you. Oh, wow. We're going back into my early life. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm from Canada, and I grew up in uh, grew up in southwestern Ontario, which is not too far from Toronto, although never in Toronto. I actually uh, was born in a city called London, Ontario. Is that right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm not really sure what to describe about it. Like I have one sister. I have two parents who stayed together throughout the course of um, my life and are still together. Mm -hmm. And uh, we moved around a lot when I was a kid because my father was a construction worker. Um, and basically he had to chase the work in order to, you know, keep the family alive. Um, but in probably like uh, 15 or 16 years ago, they settled in Kitchener, Ontario, uh, which is where my family still lives and where I recently moved back to a few years ago to be an uncle and uh, also to be a son and be a brother and go back to that family life. Hmm. I'm not sure. I feel like you ask me like, let's, let's start to your early life. It's like, well, where do you want me to go? Yeah, yeah, then sure thing. Like, no. So, I mean, how would you describe what you were like when you were young? Oh, I don't know. A child, uh, inquisitive, um, precocious, maybe. Yeah. Uh, funny. I'd like to try to be like the life of the party. Okay. I guess like to like my my heroes were like Jim Carrey. You know. Like yeah, really. Canadian. Well, I guess Canadian, or I think he's Canadian, but lives in America. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's kind of hard to say like what I was like as a kid, because I don't really remember very much about my childhood. Um, like I remember, you know, some things um, and I remember sort of themes and historical events inside of my childhood, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure I could describe what I was like as a child because as a child, I didn't really have a sense of myself being somebody in particular with a personality and characteristics. Not, none of us really do. Mm -hmm. We sort of fill that in later from the observations that are made from the people who cared for us at the time who had the capacity to observe our behavior as it developed and our higher cognitive functions came on and we established our whatever identities. So I don't really know. My, my parents say I was caring and calm, told me that uh, whenever I'd see a, another kid on the, on the playground that didn't have, wasn't playing with anyone, that I'd invite them over to come play with our group, you know? Mm -hmm. So they, they describe these things to me. But when I look back, I, I don't really have a sense of who I was yeah. so much as a, you know, a collection of memories of things that happened. Okay. And then the sort of affective qualities that are still attached to those memories. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, my understanding of um, psychedelics is that there's things that perhaps happen in your younger life, which you don't have the capability of processing 
And so you can be left with uh, lasting imprints of those things. And so with the use of psychedelics helps you often overcome things like trauma or whatnot. Are there any experiences from your younger life that you feel were either formative or were, were something that you retrospectively had to correct, uh, you know, emotionally? Well, I would say that like every experience you have when you're young is formative in your identity um, okay. moving forward. And then there are some events like that you're pointing to there. I think the, the term from Peter Levine is too much, too soon, too fast. If you talk to Bruce Sanguin, who's a like a former minister who talks about psychedelic therapy, he would say that you know violations in the in the in, in the relationship with your caregivers create heartbreak, and those heartbreaks become wounds rather than trauma mm -hmm. uh, but but what you're kind of pointing to there is like experiences that are too much for the child's nervous system to experience and also there isn't a safe place for them to be expressed there's like an adaptive uh, defensive strategy that's employed in order to essentially maintain the integrity of the primary nutrient that the child needs which is love or at least the illusion or some sense of safety in the relationship and then those defensive postures become seated into the identity. And so we begin to think that we are the way we've adapted to see and engage the world in order to protect ourselves from the things that were perceivably threats as children. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I feel like that's kind of what you're pointing to and psychedelics can sort of unravel those strategies, unravel the who I think I am mm -hmm. into how I became the person I am and, and the emotional load that's resting in the body still present even though we might think it's in the past mm -hmm. and then uh and then give an opportunity to sort of reconsolidate memories express those feelings that weren't able to be expressed recontextualize ourself um, now based in recontextualizing our experience then no longer being a child subject to a child's perception of a world they don't fully understand now being able to acknowledge and be with that that you know, me, that child's experience, but also with the, you know, the understanding of the larger context that fed into that as an adult would be able to mom stress, dad stress, mm -hmm. the, the vast complexities of being an adult and trying to raise a child in a society that essentially forces us to, forces us narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower into like two parenting, like parenting dyads into maybe like single parenting into you know, all in, in the midst of being expected to work for a society, like to work every single day in order to pay for an increasingly expensive life. And so you can have all those experiences and that can change then how that past shows up in the way you perceive yourself and the world and your place inside the world. And maybe there's a little bit of a uh, you know, mystical union with the divine all wrapped up in there or something, <laughs> you know, some sort of like essential cosmic safety, just sort of, uh, you know, sort of, brushed across the whole experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I feel like that's what you're pointing to. And yeah, so there's lots of stuff in my life that as my parents said their absolute best, they were also subject to the social context and the familial inherited family context that they were brought up in. Mm -hmm. And so there are things that have stuck around in my life that I've, with psychedelics, I've been able to just, excuse me, discover and unravel and also to make changes in my lifestyle and approach to the world to reinforce different ways of being and seeing myself, mm -hmm. different ways of relating um, so that I can not water my weeds so much and sort of focus on what it is that I'm, I'm building in this world, mm -hmm. uh, in myself and outside of me. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like that's a really long-winded way of not <laughs> answering your question. <laughs> So I hope that's all right. Yeah. That's, that's fine. <laughs> um, what were your you know, aspirations growing up in terms of your career or, you know, sort of a work? Mm, excuse me, I'm just going to clear my throat. Sure thing. <clears throat> uh, as a child, I mean, my aspirations were actually to be a writer because um, <laughs> I was writing stories since I was like eight or something. That worked uh, out. Yeah, well, <laughs> apparently. Uh, and although also my other aspirations were to be a psychologist, but uh, what's interesting is that both of those things were kind of shut down by my, by, you know, people in my educational, in the larger educational institution I was a part of that didn't recognize the impact of how they engaged my interests 
So like a writer doesn't make any money. So like art doesn't make any money typically. So it's like, well, okay, well, that's a, that seems like a fun hobby, but what are you going to do for a job? Mm. You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and also things like, uh, like when I said I wanted to be a psychologist, the first, the first time I had spoken it out loud to an adult figure who was like my teacher in this class, their response was, well, it's a lot of work and you have to work really hard for a really long time to make enough money to survive, to, to make enough money to, for it to be worth it. And I was like, oh, well, can I swear on your show? Sure thing. Oh, well, fuck that then. Because <laughs> like I was like 15 or something like, I don't want to work that hard. Are you kidding me? I don't even like school. Um, so, <laughs> so those were my aspirations. And then at some point I just finished high school and became was working in factories, uh, getting paid minimum wage. Eventually I left all of that, went on an adventure, came back, went on another adventure, came back, went on another adventure, got all messed up with substance problems, mm -hmm. came back, <laughs> <laughs> went on another adventure with mushrooms, fixed <clears throat> myself over, over 13 months, yeah. went on another adventure that looks like where we are right now. <laughs> it's like so generalizing. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, my life, not important. Just just brush over all of that. Oh, Monet? No, no. Paint roller. <laughs> yeah. There's a quote there that I read um, in, I think it was maybe one of your bios. In my early 20s, I struggled intensely with depression, emotional instability, and lack of purpose and meaning in my life. So at what point uh, and by what means did things start to change? Hmm. Well, so, wow, you're, these are great questions. Really asking me to like dip into myself in a way that I, I haven't recently. <laughs> um, so, I mean, in, in my early 20s, my early 20s, I was, I was working at a record store in Calgary and I didn't have any concern about my purpose at that point because I was pretty sure I was this cool guy who worked at a record store and my purpose was like being cool and hanging out with friends. Like, <laughs> you know, I had like a deeper consideration about things. You know, I was reading Jiddu Krishnamurti and, and this kind of stuff, you know, so mm -hmm. I was curious. Um, I needed something to replace the religion now that I had decided that I didn't believe in any of it anymore, right? Um, I'm sure you understand this, like 20s, like, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but it was it was actually when I went to Australia and uh, ended up having a little bit of an existential crisis there. Um, found psychedelics, psychedelics LSD in particular gave me a excuse me a solution to the existential crisis, which was I was struggling with who I was now in this new place, and they said, "Well, why are you bothering?" Well, the LSD gave me the insight. That's like, why am I bothering to try to be somebody else from somewhere else when I'm here and could just be who I am here, whoever I want that to be, mm -hmm. which is a great revelation. But at the time what I didn't realize is that although I had believed that I can choose to be whoever I want, that who I choose to be is, is relative to my the contextual resources I had available to me, where I was living, finances, the culture around me, and the influence of the people directly closest to me, who, uh, oh, as, as well as what sort of past things inform my behavior unconsciously. So I ended up choosing to be someone who ended up having quite a issue with substance use and reckless lifestyle choices, which you know, comparatively, I wasn't shooting heroin and smoking crack, but relative to my own life, it was the most trouble I'd ever gotten myself into insofar as lifestyle choices. And it was pretty scary place in hindsight. I was in a pretty scary place. Mm -hmm. So as that got more <clears throat> deeper and deeper and more drugs were being taken, more drugs were being taken, the more I started to really become confused. Actually, around that time in my life, I had had a I see in hindsight, I had a drug induced psychosis, um, which thankfully didn't go very far because as it got more intense, I s decided I needed to break it by doing something else, like getting out of everything I was in. Mm. It turned out to be a very positive 
sort of revamping back into, into a semi-normal state of mind. But then I had an LSD experience as well that pointed to me, pointed to me that I was in a lot of trouble. Essentially, it was like, whoa, I'm addicted to drugs. That's what the revelation was. And then all of a sudden, I basically stopped using everything pretty quickly. Um, but then I was in a place of, well, so wait, what, how did I get here? Who am I? What's happening? Like, how do I live in this life now? My friends are all still in. And I mean, the people I was around necessarily weren't in as much trouble with their life as I was, you know, like, it's not like they were all worse and they were pulling me down. It was mm -hmm. like, it was a context and I made my own out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, like, that was easier because I was still around everybody who had been with me in this process. We had all had a pretty stable friends group. So whatever. Then I moved back to Canada. And I was in my hometown where pe with people who I hadn't really seen in like six years. N none of them had taken psychedelics or like knew anything about it. I was that weirdo, you know, coming back. All of a sudden I come back and I'm in clothes like, like this essentially. <laughs> and I've got crazy hair and I'm wearing like suspenders and stuff, which was less cool then as it is now. And I was and be like, we'd be chatting and be like, have you ever heard of DMT? <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> Long before Joe Rogan, you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, but um, but yeah, that was very difficult for me. And I was living in my parents' house, and I was like, "What the hell am I doing with my life? Like, who am I? What's happening?" Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was feeling very depressed. Uh, I kind of felt like I had removed the drugs from my life, although I was still curious in psychedelics. Mm -hmm. I'd removed the drugs from my life, and that and those lifestyle choices. But there was something just like there was there was like almost the damage that I had done was still there. It was like if you kill the mold, but the mycotoxins still live. Now the <laughs> dead bodies of the mold are like, are just as toxic or more toxic than the mold living. Yeah. It's just not spreading anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I got pretty obsessed with like mostly police brutality and like government, government uh, oversight or government control, Illuminati type conspiracy stuff. Mm -hmm. Got very, that was like the way that I adapted to being angry and confused about my life as I got angry about the world being a terrible fucked up place. Uh, and in all of this, and all of this is kind of like in my, in the two books actually. So your listeners could just read them if they want like, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but uh, in all of this, I, I somehow, decided that it made sense that I could heal from all of this by taking mushrooms, which seems sort of counterintuitive. Like, oh, I have all this stuff left over from drugs and reckless choices. I should take more drugs. Mind you, had I gone to a psychiatrist, they would have thrown drugs at the problem too. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just like one of which has appeal to authority and the other of which maybe doesn't. Um, and I ended up starting with some people around me, but ultimately getting into taking solo mushroom journeys once a month, every month on the full moon, usually around four grams, basically asking, you know, like, where's the healing? Like, how, how do I heal? And uh, each experience gave me something to think about. It gave me an experience, it gave me something in the experience that felt truly meaningful, but I didn't understand what or how to live with that. And so over the 13 months, I developed a way of living in accordance with what I was learning and applying what I was learning in a way that set me up for the next experience. And then after the 13th month, I was in a different city. I was happy. I was healthy. I had great friends. I had a great job. I felt like clear. I felt like in the, in the reverse of where I was 13 months beforehand, mm -hmm. which was a dark, like, subterranean reality uh, and that is when I got the message to stop doing like I got a message from the mushrooms in my ex like it's, it's, yes. it's a weird way of putting it right but I had the insight to stop doing what I was doing <clears throat> and to just now live my life mm -hmm. um, and just apply this um, and around that time I decided I was telling other people about what I had gone through and how I was working with mushrooms which in 2011, uh, you know, I mean, it's all the rage now. Mushrooms can heal depression and mushrooms mm -hmm. can be good for you and yada, 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 yada. In 2011, nobody was talking about that. But I was talking about it with my friends and a bunch of people were like, James, this is very meaningful. Or, you know, it had positive impacts on their lives. Mm -hmm. So I decided I would 
write a book and then blah, blah, blah. So basically trying to give a model of understanding for the psilocybin experience that can help people get out of it what I got out of it, essentially. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think oh, did I just go on a crazy story journey right there? What was even your original <laughs> question? I, I was thinking that actually happened. Through. Yeah. I'm not sure what I asked, but yeah. I'm loving this. this right, yeah. what's, uh, <laughs> what's in this coffee on it? <laughs> <laughs> it's it sounds to me like a big part of what changed was your intention around, you know, why you were using things rather than using uh, any substance for recreational use. You were doing it with an intention to try and yeah, heal yourself, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know that this is a nigh on impossible um, question to ask because having heard other people describe their experiences, the English language has its own limitations because there's things that you can't, but how would you describe a psychedelic experience to someone that's never had one? Well, the thing is, is that there's the term like the psychedelic experience, which definitely points to a thing. But I would, I would wonder if the question is directed more towards a specific psychedelic because each one sort of has its own mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. uh, or its own its own characteristics. So perhaps then maybe what was the most positive experience that you had and what did you learn from it? Oh, well, those, that's, those are totally different questions. They um, are. I, I, what I mean from the second question is to perhaps describe what the actual, you know, what you witnessed, what you saw, um, what you felt, you know, on that sort of level. See, even that's a difficult question because, I mean, pretty much every one of my experiences with psychedelics has been positive. Um, that isn't to say that every one of my experiences with psychedelics have been comfortable mm -hmm. or have been pleasant mm -hmm. or have been immediately positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the con like the ongoing sort of flow of my life and the way that I've engaged even my difficult experiences have given me something very positive out of it. Yeah, so um, like they, they gave you what you needed at that time. Well, uh, they gave me what they gave me at that time. <laughs> and then I did with it what I needed to do with it in order to make it a, like, in order to weave it into the larger narrative of my life with a generative meaningfulness. Okay. Yeah. So if, I mean, again, this is like a really fancy way of avoiding your questions, right? So, um, let me go back to the first one that you asked there about sure. what I would say about a psychedelic experience. Um, it would depend on, on the person and what their sort of slant is. Maybe mm -hmm. some people are more into cognitive neuroscience and they're on that like physicalist slant, or maybe some people are more on that like new agey slant. But I would say that when you take a psychedelic, you experience yourself and the world in an entirely different way, in a way that is seemingly depending on the substance, much more magical, which includes bright magic and dark magic and much more beautiful, but also perhaps much more, um, we'll say much more poignant as well. Um, and oftentimes it can be, see, I, I, man, I don't know. I can't do it. I can't, no. I really can't do it. I feel <laughs> like, I mean, I write books and I have hundreds of hours of podcasts uh, and, audio lectures and stuff just to talk around that that question. I okay. Just, I mean, other people can maybe bring it down to a, into a, into a statement, but <laughs> maybe, get, you know, ask me that question about six hours after writing and I could be able to get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've heard people describe uh, psychedelics as the cloth that wipes clean our lens of perception. So how did you perceive reality before versus after? I'm not sure I was perceiving reality before. Right, okay. Uh, just kidding. I mean, th that, that's a very that's a very poetic way of putting it. I mean, I would I would try to I would personally try to go a little bit more literal. Um, I think you know I, I I would say like I just okay. Here's a big one. Okay, I had less understanding of how context informs perception wherein the contextual factors that are informing that perception include past uh, experiences, 
include nutritional factors, include other people around me, include things that are transpersonal, like beyond myself in many ways, and that there's all these nuances that are informing not just my perception of reality, but like how I, how and who I believe myself to be. And that reality is mutable in that sense. Although not like I create my own reality in this sort of like, I don't know, like quantum manifestation way, mm -hmm. but in the sense of like, oh, it's like I have a capacity to inform this ongoing process of generated reality by modulating the context in which I live so as to inform different qualities. And I, I didn't understand that really before. I thought of life in the, in the social narrative that I was given, which had to do with, you know, the, like the social acquisition and elevation of status sort of narrative, which I just positioned myself within. I had a ca capitalist, consumerist worldview that was the only way. There was no meta level to that. And then, of course, I was reading Krishnamurti, so I was curious when I was younger. But for the most part, my focus was very narrow, and it existed in a tunnel somewhere inside of that narrow framework of understanding the purpose of life. Mm -hmm. Where and now I understand that there's a much greater capacity, a much greater um, uh, dimension of potential for understanding myself and engaging the world and experiencing life on, you know, on a on a possibilities level, but also on like an affective level. Like there's just so much in here to experience. <laughs> there's so much right here to experience. There's just so much fullness and richness that's present that before I felt kind of like my head was down and my, my blinders were on. And mind you, it's not psychedelics that did that for me. It's psychedelics that assisted me in a process of engaging my life that led me to being able to think about that in that way. Mm -hmm. Like psychedelics, I made this tweet recently, like psychedelics are not benevolent agents of betterment. They're non-specific amplifiers of consciousness. The latter part of that being- I've got that written down here actually. Stands yeah. off Graf, right? <laughs> so it wasn't that the psychedelics made me a better person. Mm -hmm. They gave me an opportunity and what I made of that opportunity sounds like what I just described to you. Yeah, what an amazing answer. Thanks. How, how would you describe your current worldview? Uh, some combination of like profound joy and gratitude and like deep, deep, very bleak, uh, like harsh realism about the fact that there doesn't seem to be any effort to stop the mass extinction issue that we're facing right now. And we're really just driving ourselves off a cliff and the Amazon is on fire and Iceland is melting and we're basically all fucked and we're still buying Coca-Colas and jerking ourselves off in front of the television and doing <laughs> not a goddamn thing. And it's really, mm -hmm. and at the same time, what an absolute fucking blessing to be alive, period. You know, and so it's like somewhere, somewhere in there. It's a real like, mixture yeah. of uh, emotions, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the, the mainstream perception of things like psychedelics is at the moment? I think the mainstream perception is shifting a lot, especially with like the advocacy or I mean, this is a dirty word, but the, but the lo like the lobbying that's being done um, in order to create a legitimization of psychedelics through the medicalization route, mm -hmm. especially with psilocybin for depression and um, smoking cessation uh, and generally the consequence of it uh, insofar as like um, pro prolonged well-being as well as in assisting dying people in um, coming off antidepressants, less antidepressants and painkillers as they reduce total pain by resolving some existential anxieties with psilocybin. And then I believe there was some work with uh, LSD and um, alcoholism as well. And of course the profound work being done with post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. and MDMA or which is the main ingredient hopefully <laughs> in street ecstasy. Um, and, uh, and, and like the absolutely un, unfathomable positive results where it's something like I think it's something like 60% of people after the MDMA therapies who had 
like PTSD that could not be resolved by anything else are resolved. And then after like, I think it's 12 months, these are facts that I don't have. So fact check me, you know, people of the show yeah. double check. But after it's like after 16 months, it moved from 60% to 80%, which means that the experience they had after I think two sessions with MDMA and therapy, over time they got healthier and healthier and healthier. You know, could you imagine taking an antidepressant that you just take once or twice and it just like continues to better your life? You know, I mean, mm. I point to antidepressant, of course, I'm pointing to tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, all of this is, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable, really, insofar as psychiatry that these things can do these things, especially given the track record that they've had over the years, the extreme sort of demonization or marginalization. You know, you've got mushrooms are as bad as heroin too. Mushrooms are just things that stupid hippies eat to, and they hug trees and look like idiots, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, Timothy Leary is the most dangerous man in America, right? For example, like that's what Richard, Richard Nixon said. <laughs> um, so it's sort of like I see the public perception changing and it's changing in alignment towards, um, and I think this is positive, towards medicalization, um, like legislating uh, medicalization, as well as the research really gearing towards like the efficacy of medicalization, as well as what psychedelics are showing us about how the brain works and how the, how the brain, what brain activity seems to be correlated with what states and alterations of consciousness, which is obviously pretty interesting stuff for science to understand. Um, and also moving towards decriminalization in general, like in Denver yeah. and in, um, and in uh, what was it, Oakland as well. Uh, and of course, in Oregon next year, the Psy 2020 movement, which will be huge, a legislation to bring statewide psilocybin assisted therapies and facilitation to, to the whole state of Oregon, which was like, wow, what a movement that'll be, right? Mm. So I think it is, excuse me, I think it is shifting. I think that's a very positive thing. Uh, Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind has mm -hmm. changed a lot of minds. Uh, and I think, that's, I think that's generally good. I think us, us, I mean, you mentioned that you've never had this experience, right? So mm -hmm. maybe you're not included, maybe you are. <laughs> um, but I, th I think that those of us who perceive ourselves to be a part of a counter, well, not counter, like a subculture, or perceive ourselves as being part of helping the mainstream understand that psychedelics aren't, they don't need to be feared the way they've been, the way mainstream thinks they need to be feared. Mm -hmm. And also they, they deserve some level of respect. And that's in like a larger mature context of recognizing benefits as well as harms. Yeah, you know, and, and being able to reduce harm while optimizing benefits um, at the, as we go through that process that we should be careful not to to misconstrue the narratives we construct to help other people understand, especially mainstream people, as being the narratives by which we understand our own experiences. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there's a lot to be lost when we go mainstream like the shaving the edges off the thing. This is something I got from one of your guests, Stephen Jenkinson, you know, mm -hmm. you shave the edges off the thing until it becomes so widely palatable that it might as well just be in the whitewash with the rest of it, mm -hmm. right? And society will, will benefit if there's a society left to benefit mm -hmm. um, from psychedelics being institutionalized into medical care and on a cultural level into it being more easily accessible in a safe and controlled manner, in an, and in a um, well-educated manner to the population. But those things have to, like, if, if, if it just got flooded with psychedelics, you'll get what happened in the 60s, which wasn't good. I mean, maybe yeah. shutting it down, hard criminalization, was actually the only way to stop the damage that was being done. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you know, we hum and haw about how, we, we, what's, the, what's the term, it's like we, uh, we, we grumble about it now, ah, Nixon, bastard, you know, <laughs> or whatever, I, he kind of was a bastard, but like, um, pot, that was, what else were we gonna do? It was completely out of control. And I, yeah. I don't think we want that again. I don't think any of us want to see that again. Mm -hmm. um, and, wow, that coffee man, it's killing me. <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> 
you were um we'll, we'll, we'll do another question great uh you were interviewed earlier in the year on fox news yeah. um which was interesting and i wondered what their their overall sort of stance on it was um, but I've got a sort of semi quote here. Aldous Huxley believes it was the fundamental craving of the human spirit, a desire to turn off the survival based filter of perception just for a moment and catch a glimpse beyond the bars of our cognitive prison. Um, profound words. I mean, you know, in what way do you think the world would be different if everyone had had this kind of an experience? Mm. Well, <sighs> two things one of which is like i can't guarantee like just because you have an experience like that doesn't mean that you're going to be a good person hmm. yeah just lay that out there yeah. like i said not benevolent benevolent agents of betterment mm -hmm. um although i was asked uh, a question at the talk in edinburgh here through the psychedelic society of edinburgh um one of the questions was if i felt like like oneness consciousness which is something that could be perceivably experienced with psychedelics on various levels. There's the level of like for psilocybin, for example, which I can speak to a little bit more definitively right mm -hmm. now. It dissolves the ego structure, it reduces blood flow to the default mode network, which is associated with the ego function. And so the, the, the part of the mind that creates clear boundaries between who I am and who you are sort of dissolves away like reduces activity so it like disintegrates i guess and like that's a technical term for what it's doing with the brain right and so um all of a sudden like i am not as separate from you like oh I, I, you and i are maybe the same like i've had experiences where i look and i can't tell like is that your face or my face mm. and whoa that's trippy man but also that's extremely profound mm -hmm. right and possibly it's beyond just you and I, it could be an experience of, this is uh, coming out of the research now around how um, psychedelic use is directly correlated with increased um, environmental behaviors, or yeah, environmental behaviors, uh, environmentalist behaviors. Anyways, and, and, and they suggest that that's because people change their self-control, they change the way they identify themselves as, or position themselves in the larger world where it's like i'm no longer a human and that's nature i am nature i am that tree i am that plant mm -hmm. i am this air that i breathe that soil those bones you know or sorry those rocks that whatever that's that's my bones this water is my blood and that's true yeah but we don't think about that and we conduct ourselves as though you know we are islands or maybe from this monotheistic nature is here for us because God gave it to us to use or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then after you have that experience, it changes the way you engage. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're a better person, but it definitely changes things. Um, so the, and then there's a, this even like beyond that where one might experience being, literally being one with or one as all of existence across time and space as a singular point of awareness that for some people is filled with emptiness, which is kind of distressing, but for many people is filled with fullness and love, right? So that's a profound experience, doesn't require psychedelics. Certainly there's historical writings since the beginning of writing itself, possibly mm -hmm. all of the world religions are situated in some sort of experience, something like that, psychedelics or not. And the question of like, okay, is that the next evolutionary step? Well, I don't know, because evolution is not a one track up. And to say oneness consciousness is an evolutionary step seems like a bit of a, you know, bit of a, uh, a disprovable, an, an unprovable opinion, mm -hmm. right? Um, with little to no maybe scientific backing. But if if we are to, this is my question, if we are to evolve, whatever that means, and we would need to actually stay alive. And if we are to stay alive, we would be pretty damn well served to start recognizing that we're all one planet facing an extinction level event. And whatever petty qualms we have, we need to put aside. And we need to start thinking about the fact that like, we need to make a change and we need to protect the earth that we're on. And we need to do it not so that we can continue to have more effective 
extraction industries. We need to do it because it's what we need to do because this is our home. Mm -hmm. This is my, that, that's my blood. Mm -hmm. That water is my blood. That's our blood. That's your blood. And you and I are the, not that we're the same, but if I hurt you, I hurt me. You know, if I hurt me, I hurt you. And like recognizing these types of things and moving forward as if that were the case, moving forward as if we were in this all together. And it matters not just for me and not just for you and not just for everyone who's alive now, but all the people who have yet to exist, who have yet to step into the beauty of this life and the challenge and the hardships and whatever that are yet to be here that will not be here if we don't make the choices now to act collectively in integrity and care mm -hmm. in order to alter the direction we're headed. And so in that oneness, oneness consciousness mm -hmm. would be extremely helpful if not absolutely necessary. And psychedelics can offer that. Mm -hmm. Is that the role psychedelics will play? It seems to be the role psychedelics are playing in a lot of people's lives. Is that where society would have gone if psychedelics had already been integrated? I don't know. Maybe if they had gone the legitimate route and never broken out of the lab back in the 50s, Possibly they would only be for use in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. Possibly there wouldn't be a, a, a mass 40 years of underground people taking it out in the woods and praying to whatever God awakens inside them. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have these types of considerations. I don't know. Mm -hmm. hmm. What does the term, you, you mentioned a couple of times, what does the term God mean to you? It's like a, just like a really easy term. You just throw it out there. People kind of get a sense of it. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your god oh what's my god oh geez i just i just thought about a marilyn manson song um <laughs> this, i was just checking this mic uh i don't know i don't know how to answer that i have a relationship with in i have a relationship internally and externally with something that seems to be the something that is here that also seems to be really beneficial for me to relate to. And it's been positive in my life. And I'm not sure I wanna say too much more about it. Yeah. Okay. I will say that that something is not a anthropomorphized patriarchal figure that's using coercive blame and shame to manipulate my behavior into some sort of social construct of appropriateness. Mm -hmm. Definitely will tell you that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well said. <laughs> oh. Taken from uh, one of your uh, bios, as a creative entrepreneur, you have successfully utilized crowdfunding to independently publish two books, launch an interview-based podcast and tour around the world, both as a speaker and a researcher of psychedelic plants, cultures, and medicine. What advice would you give to anyone looking to self-fund their own work in the way that you have? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um... I'd say like, be honest. I mean, there's a certain level of honesty. I might, in the first few rounds, I wouldn't get up and be like, hey guys, feeling pretty constipated today. My name's James Gesso. I mean, like maybe if it was a comedy show, right? But um, I'd say like the biggest thing I think that has benefited me and people feedback as being meaningful for them is that I am honest with like, with who I am in the sense like I, I'm not trying to be, I mean, I, I, I definitely effort to a certain level of professionalism, mm -hmm. but I'm not trying to be someone I'm not, and I'm not trying to hide the person that I am um, in order to deliver a message. And so since from the very beginning, I was encouraged not to brand around a product, but to brand around myself as a person, I've continued to stay with that and to move forward knowing that if I'm branding around myself as a person, then I want to represent myself in a way um, that is honest, that I don't get confused into trying to make myself, like confused into believing that I am the thing that I made myself to look as. I'm not sure if that sentence made a lot of grammatical <laughs> sense, but, um, and also that I, I want to make a positive impact in the world and I want to inspire people. And so to bring myself to the world in the way that I'd like to inspire other people to be, which is honest and comfortable with myself and authentic, sort of a weird word. Um, 
Yeah, I think I think it would just be to like be yourself and uh, w within a certain confines of like maybe yourself as is like the optimal way you'd like to <laughs> like to be maybe. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, not to not to be disingenuous. There's a lot of disingenuous marketing like the mm. Facebook ads. Instagram influencers, Instagram is like, this is the best product ever. Hey, what's up guys? My name is blah, blah, blah. And I can make you like $7,000 in the next 20 seconds. Yeah. All you gotta do is read these books or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you like books? Uh, you, you, Ty I, Lopez, you know what I'm talking about, right? So weird. I feel like, I don't know. I feel like maybe maybe that's it, but I don't really know. Like I've just been, I've just been doing the thing and I don't know exactly, I can tell you what I've done but why it's worked, I'm not really sure. I just feel absolutely blessed and lucky. I know that I've worked hard for it. It's not like it came to me easily. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. like I just like woke up one day and was like, oh shit, look at all this success. It was like, <laughs> oh wow, you know, I've worked hard for this, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure how it wasn't a plan or a map. I'm just figuring it out as I go along and just mm -hmm. waking up grateful every single day that it's, it's got me this far. But you do come across as a very humble, likable person. Thank you. Yeah. Sweet, bro. <laughs> I reckon I'm pretty humble. <laughs> <laughs> Go to my website and click on this link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The donate button's on the top yeah. right, yeah? <laughs> well, thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, what do you feel is your purpose in life? <laughs> um, to make money, yo. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> obviously. Um, I mean, right now, I think like a purpose is, is not like a static thing, it's a process. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort, of, it sort of changes, but right now I'd say like, my purpose has something to do with public education and like being a part of uh, a growing culture, like a, like a growing culture that's been like deep seated now for some time since the 50s psychedelic culture has been coming into a thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but now is growing quite rapidly and trying to play an important role in sort of, in sort of educating, uh, educating and contributing to that. So educating like the new people coming in by contributing to the discussion of the people who have been in, around for a long time, um, like being one of those people, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd say like right now that's, that's my professional purpose and my creative purpose. And if I were to be, you know, like fully transparent with you, my, my ultimate purpose right now is to conduct myself in my life, both out into the world and in myself in a way that supports me in being an amazing caregiver to three little boys, which are my sister's children who I'm a very important member of the family unit. And it's extremely important to me that they have, especially with all I know about early childhood life, that they have an, they, they have an incredible experience of being loved and nurtured into the people they're becoming. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to me to like, my purpose in many ways is also to be myself and discover and blah, 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 but recognize that it's not about me and that these little boys need yeah, I don't know how to describe this. It's like just to figure out how I need to be in order to love them the way they need to be loved to become the people they're discovering themselves to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then additionally, there's a larger consideration there about the importance of showing up with integrity into my relationships, integrity and care. And and um, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know how much time I have. Like mm -hmm. neither of us do. You just spoke with Stephen Jenkinson. It's like my yeah. death is right here. You know, it is my faithful companion and it's hanging around and it informs my decisions, not in a reactive, frightening way, but in a way of like, oh, I need to show up like I need to show up and I need to be able to be a good uncle now and be a good son and brother and partner and friend now mm -hmm. because it's like I don't know how much time I'm going to have in order to put that into the relationships before I might be gone, at which point all that will be left is what I left them with. And I want that to be something really positive for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. This is, I mean, this is obviously going to be 
pure conjecture, but what do you think will happen when you die? I don't know. Have you had any glimpses into what that might be like, given any of the experiences that you've had? I've had some terrifying experiences. Like I nearly died in 2014, that was pretty scary. But it wasn't the dying part that was scary, it was the coming back and recognizing what had happened that was scary. All right, good. Um, I had one of the revelations when I realized I finally could go back through the trauma memory into the point beforehand, before I got frightened mm -hmm. and realized I was in a place of absolute, like, not like peace, just like neutrality, equanimity. It was just like things are, you know. Um, I mean, this is this is really big. I don't really know what to say. I, I I definitely noticed that I no longer have sort of a monotheistic, religious, mythological take on things. Like I don't believe God's coming to welcome me. Saint Peter ain't coming to welcome me. You know, at the gates of heaven. Um, I, I mean, that wasn't a thing anyways. My father was a Jehovah's Witness, my mother Pentecostal. So like mm -hmm. my mother, yeah, say gates of heaven, angels and stuff. But my father, it's like die and go in the grave. If you're a good person, you'll be resurrected forever in paradise earth where like people of all colors will wear, wear very tacky pastel clothing and cuddle with tigers and sure, whatever, you know. Um, anyone who's seen any of that that imagery in the Jehovah's Witness text is probably laughing right now, right? <laughs> um, or crying, <laughs> it's a different. <laughs> But I just, so I don't have that. And then of course, like the other side of that is society's death phobia and the secularism and the atheism and, and the, the oblivion, especially the way society conducts themselves after a person dies. It's like the, the goal of grief is to get over it, right? And mm -hmm. so what, again, I'm pointing to Stephen, obviously you're talking about death, Stephen Jenkinson's like a huge influence in how I think about these things. Yeah. And it's like, you know, to get over the person who died so you could live a life as though they never were. You could live a life as though their death wasn't, and thus they never were. And so that's basically like dying into oblivion. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make me feel very good. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know. And thankfully, I've had enough experiences where I've been given I've been given reason to trust the process, that I just trust the process and I'm learning. Like I had one experience with, with a ketamine. I did a, um, like a, an underground ketamine therapy session. Uh, and I didn't know what I was going in for. It was really just psychonautic. And uh, I was really thinking a lot about dying and not wanting to, <laughs> preferably, right? Yeah. And then it got into, not wanting to do it wrong, you know, not not knowing if I'll do it right, mm -hmm. and being afraid of doing it wrong, being afraid of the pain, being afraid of the fear, being afraid of the despair, being afraid of the heartbreak, of like I don't know what the context would be if I'm lucky enough to be alive enough to know that I'm dying, like the heartbreak of having to say goodbye to everyone I love, knowing that they're having to say goodbye to me, you know, like I'm afraid of all of that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm not running away from it, but of course, it's it's hard to think about, right? Yeah. Um, and in the experience, something just happened, and I got the sense of like, it's going to be okay. Life will carry me. Like life will carry you all the way through dying and all the way into death. And regardless of how good a job you do or don't do, life is going to carry you over the threshold. So you don't need to worry about that. Mm -hmm. That didn't make the fears go away, didn't make the pain go away, but mm -hmm. some knot unraveled somewhere there, um, which was really meaningful for me. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I understand what death is or what my dying is or what's happening afterwards. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I feel lucky enough to have just a glimmer of, you know, trust the process mm -hmm. to face all the difficulties that arise with the acknowledgement and the living with my death and yeah. the death of everyone I care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what do you think is the meaning of life? Um, well, I mean, if you say the meaning of life, it infers some sort of like, um, like absolute, uh, okay. which I don't think is, is fair. Yeah. Um, I would think of it more like um, what might be some potential meaninglessness or meanings of life. Um, and I think that's different for every person. 
And I think everyone's got one, even if you feel like I don't have a meaning to life, it's basically saying like the meaningness I have that I associate to life is full of emptiness, despair, confusion, disorientation, right? Mm -hmm. um, aloneness, abandonment, whatever, right? Um, and I say like recently the, the meaning that I am having with life has, is very exploratory and curious and um and uh really focused on the quality of relationship and the yeah the quality of relationship in my life and exploring that with others mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and really just living and not in a living big kind of way but like in a living honest living present well that sounds so hokey <laughs> you know like um like, I don't really know. I'd say the meaningness is, is, is acknowledging that I don't know and trusting the process and yeah. discovering what's beautiful and what's painful in that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. You mentioned psychonautic, I think is the word you used. It's funny because I messaged you last night to get your views on the word psychonaut because I wasn't sure if from a sort of purist perspective that was maybe a pejorative term, but doesn't seem to have been inflammatory in any way thus far. No, I mean, like, I wouldn't see the thing is, I wouldn't see it as a pejorative. That's why when you asked okay. me about it, I was like, yeah, sure, use it, but I might have something to say. Yeah, um, yeah. It's not like a, a, it's not like I have an adversarial stance against the term. I okay. think it's a great term. And I think it's, I think it's awesome idea, you know, it's very curious. Yeah. Um, but it was more or less the suggestion that that's what I am. I don't take a lot of psychedelics, all the psychedelics to just explore them. Okay. Right, that I'm not a psychonaut. I believe myself to be a psychedelic person who has a relationship with some psychedelics some of the time, not so much recently as I did beforehand, because I've had some incredible, powerful, moving experiences that have given me more than enough for the rest of my life. And mm -hmm. if I were to consider myself a psychonaut, it would be very much exploring how my mind constructs my world yes. with or without psychedelics included. Um, okay. And also because I said before, like, my priority or my purpose in many ways is caring for these kids and I can't care for kids if I'm taking drugs I mean mm. you know if you know what I mean like I have to it's very important to me that I have a clear mind a healthy life a healthy environment a safe environment it's extremely important to me and so I don't consider myself a psychonaut because the psychedelic experience psychedelic research philosophy huge part of my life mm. the actual psychedelics not as and the actual like deep exploring these days, not as not as full as they used to be, mm. not as not as frequent as they used to be. How how do you distinguish between the terminology of say drugs versus medicine? Well, I mean they're all drugs, but <laughs> okay. medicine infers that there's maybe like a healing capacity there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just thought I'd clarify that because mm -hmm. yeah. What would you like your legacy to be? Uh that's well i mean there's lots lots of stuff there um it would depend so like my professional legacy will be what i've built and what i'm building whatever that ends up being so i couldn't say what that what i want that to be just for it to have been right for, yeah. um and insofar as my larger sort of web of relationships. I would like it if generally people walk away from having interacted with me feeling like it was a pleasant and generative experience, um, even if it might be, have been difficult or challenging, you know, as it, you know, I feel difficult and challenging interactions arise in my life, obviously. <laughs> um, I, w I would like that, especially the people I'm close with, to mm -hmm. feel like my involvement in their life was a positive thing. Um, and for that to carry on and insofar as my nephews that uh, the legacy is somebody who worked as an example for them on how to be a good person and responsible caring and show up to life with that with that type of mentality mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. I'm just I'm, I'm just sort of picking up on little bits that you're saying whilst you're answering these questions James um, <laughs> what what I said, what is the, the the bigger vision for your brand and the work that you do then uh, well, see, that's always hard. I'm not, I'm not really good at like the 
<clears throat> figuring out the bigger vision for my brand kind of thing. Like I said, I've been kind of stumbling through this and learning along the way. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe like the way you introduced, you said you said these three words or something, uh, entertainment, education, enlightenment. And and enlightenment. Yeah, yeah. Um, They're stolen from one of my other guests. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I feel like the larger, the larger thing for me is really to, like, to keep my my thumb on the pulse of the psychedelic culture, mm -hmm. and to pay attention, and then to curate my guests. Excuse me, to curate my guests, and formulate my questions in a way that showcases and expands what's on the pulse. Um, while additionally bringing a quality of discourse to it that is present in how I show up to the conversation and how I, um, how I create a space for their work to be showcased. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. And then additionally, I have my own journeys in my own learning and in my own sort of growth and maturity in this world. And that informs how I curate as well. And so bringing in that sort of larger investigation and curiosity about what does it mean to bring the psychedelic experience into our lives, let it inform our lives in a way that is generative. Um, although now that I say generative, I feel like it has this like linear infinite growth feel to it that is kind of gross now that I, I say it. But like, you know, this, this we'll just say generative feel or, or positive ah oh, that's dirty too i'm, I'm strapped <laughs> up what's the word now um but like bringing bringing something from the psychedelic experience that like that helps to take away things and bring things in in a way that is on the whole positive to the quality of the relationships which isn't necessarily on the whole bringing greater happiness or peace or whatever it might be on the whole bringing more honesty or integrity more contextual awareness mm. or whatever um yeah i would want to bring i want i would want to bring more of that yeah to mm. oh sorry i got i almost forgot my question i want to bring that from the psychedelic experience into life which means bringing that type of investigation into matters of the psychedelic but then also bringing the things that the matters of the psychedelic bring into mind into the conversation too, such as dying, sexuality, relationships, trauma, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then bringing all of that into a culture. Because I believe psychedelic culture is very positive and it's not just psytrance and dope clothes and bright colors and, yeah. and, and visionary art. All of that's cool. <laughs> uh -huh. you know? But it, there's, there's something more to it. There's a richness that's there but that richness of the culture only expresses itself if it's ongoingly cultivated and put in. And I'm efforting towards, I don't know if I'm achieving it, but I'm efforting towards bringing that richness into the larger cultural discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. See, it's funny because the, the Fox News thing, I don't think it really did any justice to what you're doing, if you like. I thought you, you came across brilliantly. I thought you handled yourself really well. I thought you were incredibly articulate and you made some great points, but the way that they sort of pre-framed it by just having these slightly kind of ludicrous off the wall people as though it was some sort of, yeah, I didn't, didn't quite like their portrayal of it, but. I, you know, I knew, I knew what I was getting into. Yeah, of course. Um, and I also knew that um, I got a lot of encouragement for people that if it was anybody, it should be me. And I, you know, I received that with an open hand mm -hmm. and, uh, and I went for it and I, 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 okay. Remember I said to be authentic. I was totally inauthentic in that interview. I like, you couldn't see my hair. You couldn't see my ears. You couldn't see this thing that many of your guests might be just distracted with. He looks like a bull, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, like I, I get that all the time. You know, like, <laughs> I do look like a bull. It's just, it's every day to remind me that I'm a slave to the capitalist system. <laughs> um, but, uh, and to remind everybody else too. <laughs> Anyways, the point is, is like I, I presented myself in a way because I knew that image is everything in a four minute interview and that they would try to he would try to um, to uh, dismantle me. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, would mischaracterize me as being insignificant or mm. something or, or, or ridiculous or what have you. Yes. Um, and so I had to bring a certain level of professionalism 
according to the confines or the cultural image of what professionalism means in the demographic of people that he speaks to. And I also recognized that he would, he would push back against me and he would be mocking. And so I needed to be very serious as well yeah. to not give any lee- leeway. And to his, be- to, to his um, respect, mm-hmm. to respect, he saw that I think at some point in the interview and he, he conceded, I think the term of was conceded a bit of territory to me here. Yeah. We met on equal grounds. And then he asked what some people would think of as stupid questions, but actually very reasonable questions that somebody entirely uninformed about psychedelics and overly informed in prohibitionist narrative mm. would ask. Mm-hmm. And so I give to him to his benefit like that he did that. And yes, it was set up to make me look like a fool from the beginning. <laughs> and so I presented myself in a way that it was difficult to to stick me with with that yes. with that archetype. Yeah. Um, which is all stuff I talked about in my being interviewed on Fox News Trip Report, which I made a YouTube video about. Um, yeah, but I, I was I was very very nervous. Like I had friends around. I was like pretty much shaking beforehand. Um, I had one friend who just like sat there like doing Reiki, like holding her chest um, and like putting her hand out to me while I was on the interview, being very, being very serious. And she's basically like praying for me. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I didn't smile very serious because i was pretty much just holding so much energy and all i could do was just answer straight direct questions with no smile on my face so, yeah yeah so yeah it was a good experience i thought Definitely. maybe something crazy would happen as a consequence but just a bunch of people shared it a bunch of people saw it and then everybody moved on which was not so bad maybe not a bad thing actually yeah. <laughs> i've just got a few more questions for you um, sure. how do you define success um I don't define success. Again, I have more of like a like a, like a process orientation around that. Um, although I'll have certain marking points, like certain goal posts, we'll say, uh, that would make for me to feel as though I were successful in that particular endeavor. Mm-hmm. And those goal posts don't shift over time. I just find new ones. Okay. that are a little bit further along, higher up, more complicated to reach, whatever metaphor you want to use, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then allow that to inspire and infuse my capacity to keep moving forward. So at one point, you know, success would be to write the book. Yeah. And now I've written two and I do the thing. And then another point I wrote down, like success would be like being an author traveling around the world speaking. And I've done that and I feel mm-hmm. successful in that. And then at one point, success um, was to get $200 a month on Patreon, $250 a month on Patreon. That was success. And I did that. And now there's other things that are like, for example, I have like a first goal post on my Patreon, which once achieved would equate to a living wage where I live. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like another goal post. Like an, uh, additionally, another one each each year, I give an, a, like a new lecture oftentimes. So a new goal would be to complete that lecture and to do a good job and to have people feel like they got something really positive out of coming to see me speak. And so when that, when I feel as though I succeeded at that, I feel success. But I don't have in my mind like what success is yeah. so much as it is like a, like a feeling state like a, a feeling state that's relational to my goal set that yeah. is also, you know, woven into, you know, whatever the context of that goal set is within. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sure someone that I've spoken to in the past referred to success as the achievement of goals. There's maybe more to it than that, but yeah. No one's ever asked me that question before. So nice to know that I didn't <laughs> pull something totally out of my ass. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, we'll say, uh, and I won't explain the context at all, but, and, 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 and I'll have to paraphrase it okay? because I'd have to explain the context, um, but don't let your heart break heel over. Interesting. Yeah. And mind you, that's kind of weird because like also I pointed to Bruce Sanguin's work and how early life heartbreak informs a lot of like 
what he calls like core unconscious beliefs and compensational actions and behaviors that contribute to like the degradation of your quality of life and relationship. But that's not the kind of heartbreak I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you had the opportunity to speak to your 20 year old self, what would you say? Uh, it's going to be all right. Huh. But it won't always be all right. But it's going to be all right. <laughs> In the order. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last question is a big one. If you could change anything in the world, what would it be and why? Yes, next question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would, if honestly, I would, I don't know, because like it has to do with where we're at right now as a species and our relationship to the extinction uh, event that we are a part of mm -hmm. and a huge contributor to in the climate crisis. And, it, and, and I don't know what it is that would need to change in order for the thing I would like to happen to happen. And the thing I would like to happen is for us to come together and face this problem in a successful way mm -hmm. um, that that stops um, the like the progressive destruction of life on pla on this planet. Yes. Um, and moves towards not just sustainable, but regenerative living on this in this world in a way that at the, if if doesn't bring back what we've taken away, creates an opportunity for life to bring itself back. What change would need to be made to get there? I, I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. But that's the outcome I'd like to see. Hmm. Yeah, brilliant, James. It's been honestly an absolute honor speaking with you. I've loved hearing your perspectives, uh, some amazing answers, and yeah, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you too, Elliot. <laughs> Cheers, my friends. <laughs>